bring in Martin Feldstein of Harvard University. Uh, too many things to speak of with him. John Bates Clark, medal winner a few years ago. Good to have you here, sir. Good Climb to be up with on you. the stool. Great to be Good with to you. Good to see you, Professor. Um, I could talk about chapter three of the IMF survey, but we'd lose two thirds of our viewers <laughs> right away. Let's talk the dollar. Um, I was at Stanford when you gave a speech at John Chauvin's uh, Economic Policy Institute, and you put must in capital letters. Why does the dollar have to go down? Well, I think the dollar is going to go down. That's not a statement that we, U.S. government, should make it go down but that we're looking at an enormous trade deficit and that's going to eventually f put pressure on the dollar to bring it down. Let's look at this chart over here. This is dreaded first chart. The dollar must go down. This is the price adjusted trade weighted dollar and you can see the move from 2002 and there's the Martin Feldstein dollar must go down in the last two or three years. Are you suggesting we break below that 2008-9 uh, weakness in the right corner of the chart? Yes, I think it definitely will. And it's not just the trade uh, deficit. If you talk to uh, managers that have large pools of dollars, uh, Sovereign Wealth Funds Norway. and others. Abu Dhabi. Right, exactly. So they have a, an overweight of dollars. They have too many dollars in their portfolio. They were gradually moving into euros, and that was weakening the dollar relative to the euro. And then all hell broke loose in Europe. Can we say that on air? Okay, <laughs> Feldstein can say that. I can't. All hell broke loose on air. Go ahead. <laughs> and I wondered about that. And when, uh, when that happened, they stopped this shift from dollars into euros. But that's going to start again. It's starting again. And when it does, the euro will strengthen. It is strengthening now, and it will strengthen further. Remember, it was at 160 at some point not too right. long ago. No, you've been right about this weakness. Why should our viewers not fear dollar weakness? That's a great part of your theme. Well, dollar weakness will be one of the few things that will improve our trade balance and that will strengthen our exports and will cause American consumers to shift from imported goods to domestic services primarily. And all of that will strengthen the economy. Is so I'm not advocating it. I'm just saying I think the natural forces are going to make that happen. Might I suggest that a weak dollar signals higher interest rates and it helps savers in America? Um, a weak dollar could, under certain circumstances, push up um, interest rates, um, but I think the primary uh, effect is going to be on the trade balance. You, you did a lot of research in the early 60s, middle 60s rather, on medicine and health care, and then there was the Feldstein shift to the budget deficit. When you wrote those papers, look at this chart over here, budget deficit and the dollar. You can see it, Professor Feldstein, on camera two and camera three over there. That's a gorgeous Joan Johnson chart. Did you ever think we'd see that plunge in deficit to GDP? GDP. Uh, what would Ronald Reagan say about that now? You know, one of his goals was to shrink the budget deficit, and by the time the Reagan administration ended, even though there have been some temporary increases, by the time it ended on a cyclically adjusted basis, um, the budget deficit excluding uh, interest was very close to zero, mm -hmm. very close to zero. And right now we're heading in just the opposite direction to very high fiscal deficits and a national debt that will double between now and the end of the decade. Do you give President Clinton credit for that surplus we saw? Good. Take the mobile over there if you would. Look at that little bump. No, don't no, take away the Financial Times and bring me back the chart if you would, Rex. That was my fault, Rex. Bring back, there it is. Look at that little blip right, right above where we had surplus in the late 90s. Who gets the credit for that? Who gets the bragging rights? Oh, the Clinton administration certainly does and Bob Rubin. Uh, but the way they got it, doesn't make me happy. They raise taxes and they cut defense spending. What's Larry Summers going to do back at Harvard? Well, he's going to teach, I hope, and maybe he and I will even do some teaching together. That would be very good. Mark, what's the first day like for PhD students under Martin Feldstein? <laughs> do you throw chalk? No, no, no. Stanley Fisher once said, Paul Samuelson grabbed the chalk out of his hand and threw it across the room. 
I'm a much calmer guy. Yeah. Well, Professor Kotlikoff, there, this is a disturbing chart. So far from the 1970s, this is the savings. I'm going to let you explain this. This is not the savings that I have or, or, or Daniel, the camera guy, and the dolly has. This is the savings of the nation. It's private savings, corporate savings, and government savings. And it's not pretty, is right. it? No. It, it, the strange thing is private savings has gotten a lot better in the last few years, after falling year after year, it turned around about three years ago. It's tripled as a percentage of after-tax income. It went from 2% to 6%. Businesses save about 3% of GDP, but the government, Oops. government looking ahead over the rest of this decade is going to be borrowing between 5 and 6% of GDP every year. I would guess that you and Peter Orzag would agree that we've got to get back somewhere where Professor Kotlikoff is talking about 8%, 10% level. How do you propose to do that? Well, the key thing is going to be reducing the government borrowing, reducing the government deficit. Corporate saving will stay more or less where mm -hmm. it's been. A household saving, I think, has recovered from the low level, and they're going to may even go higher. It used to be significantly higher than it is now because households still have lost a lot of money in this downturn, so they have a strong incentive to save. But the government is the key. How do we reduce the fiscal Give deficit? us the why for our viewers that a nation needs a certain level of savings. It really links right into confidence and investment as well, doesn't it? You can only invest what you save or what you get from the rest of the world. And we have been living on funds from the rest of the world. And at some point, that line of credit is going to run out. So we cannot continue to be in debt at a growing rate to the rest of the world. So it's very important that we build up our savings here so that we can finance our own investment. Because the investment, and remember, this is investment in plant mm -hmm. and equipment. It's investment in housing. If we don't do that, the capital stock doesn't keep up with the growing labor force. I need help. I'm interviewing Alan Greenspan tonight, 8 p.m., folks, uh, worldwide on Bloomberg Radio and on TV. There'll be all sorts of it tomorrow. We'll have some on the show tomorrow. Um, it's a lot of fun. I've got Alan Meltzer, two volumes. I've got The Age of Turbulence. Mm -hmm. Give me the question you'd ask Chairman Greenspan right now. What would be his specific recommendations for bringing down the fiscal deficit? And he told me in a conversation three days ago, that's his number one focus right now. Every, everybody in monetary economics is focused on fiscal economics, and it's remarkable. Let's bring up uh, Alan Greenspan's op-ed piece uh, today in the Financial Times, Fear Undermines uh, an American uh, Recovery. Uh, it is this rapid rise in aversion to illiquid investment risk that explains a large part of the anemic, spelled the British way, recovery uh, in the United States. Lionel Barber does that. Program has two M's. I don't know why he does that. But anyways, uh, uh, this is a serious issue. This uncertainty out there, and we just can't get private investment jump-started. Would you yes. please, yeah, would you please ex ex expand on what we hear from Alan Greenspan here? Why is there that uncertainty? Companies and individuals are uncertain about the tax laws. Um, they're uncertain about regulation. Uh, the health uh, bill that just passed is going to have an enormous impact on businesses, especially and a small long businesses. impact, like Dodd Frank. Permanent, it's years. Perma permanent, it, yeah. permanent impact. Uh, and they don't know what it's going to be. They don't know how much it's going to cost them. They don't know what the regulations are going to be. Mm -hmm. So, of course, companies, not only that, the president has given the impression that he just doesn't like business. He doesn't like small businesses. You got that like, feeling in Washington this well, week when you... You get it every day. I mean, Any time you read what he says or listen to what he says, uh, he, uh, that's not his constituency. And, and he doesn't like high-income individuals. He makes that very clear. This is a distinction between Feldstein and Greenspan on the Bush tax cuts, isn't it? I don't know exactly where Alan Chairman is Chairman Greenspan, days. and I'll learn about this tonight again, he wants to get uh, those, those tax cuts back to work on the deficit, I believe, sooner than you do. Well, what I want to do is to keep the Bush tax cuts, all of the current tax rates, in place for the next two years. Mm -hmm. I think the economy is too weak to raise taxes. At the end of the two years, I would say 
clean slate, start all over again, see where the economy is, see what progress we've made in bringing down spending, and then consider what can be done. But I wouldn't commit, as the president wants to, to a permanent tax cut for um, middle-income and low-income individuals that's going to add $2 trillion between 2013 yeah. and the end of well, the decade. I'm going to leave one more chart with you. Let's bring up too much information, Rex, if you could. This is an important chart. I didn't look at this, Professor Feldstein, until I knew you'd be here. This is the portion of our output, our economic growth, our GDP, that is personal consumption. And I was shocked, looking back 20, 30 years, it's barely a blip in this crisis. I mean, it's lower, but we've barely had consumption come back. I mean, it's come back a little bit, but we're still consuming a lot, aren't we? Uh, we are, but you have to, to put it in perspective, you have to look at it relative to after-tax incomes, not in just total dollars. And on that basis, we saw consumption rising very sharply mm -hmm. uh, from 1985 until 2007, and now it's come down significantly. Highlight of my weekend, the Harvard women's water polo team <laughs> made a visit to my world headquarters, and the first question I said is, how many of you have taken ec 10 And almost every hand went up. That's good. Is Man Q teaching the same course you taught for years, or uh, is he made new, are you, are you, do you, you say, Greg, he, do this, he, do he this. No, 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 we, I don't tell him what to do, but he and I see the world economy very similarly. Good. I'm sure it's a, a very good course. Thank you so much for coming by today. Martin Feldstein, Baker Professor, Harvard University.